Hello and welcome. The presentation will begin momentarily. Thank you for joining. The presentation will begin momentarily. Good day. We will begin with a few remarks to assist you in the meeting experience. ASL interpretation and CART services will be provided throughout the meeting. ASL interpreters will be spotlighted. If joining via Zoom, on-screen experience may vary depending upon your web browser or Zoom application version. If you should have any difficulty in accessing the ASL interpretation, you may try the YouTube live stream for this presentation. A link will be provided in the chat. You may enable captions on your device by clicking the closed caption or CC button in the Zoom webinar or on the YouTube webpage to begin viewing closed captioning. The presentation is being recorded and live streamed to EEOC's YouTube channel. You will be able to access the recorded version on YouTube. A link will be provided in the chat. And now may I present Chair Charlotte Burroughs of the EEOC. Thank you, Mark, and welcome to everyone who's joining our second roundtable for the hiring initiative to reimagine equity, also known as HIRE. As you may be aware, HIRE is a multi-year collaborative effort that chair, uh, that I am chairing, rather, co-chairing with OFCCP Director Ginny Yang. And HIRE has begun engaging a broad cross-section of uh, stakeholders to examine policies and practices so that we can reimagine equity. We want to identify strategies to remove unnecessary barriers to recruitment and hiring, as well as promote effective job-related practices to expand opportunities to a diverse workforce. As our country emerges from the pandemic, employers are confronting challenges in recruiting and retaining workers. Similarly, many workers are looking for good jobs and an opportunity to use their talents. Yet the path to equal employment opportunity is much harder for workers who have been out of the workforce for some period of time. These are often referred to as hidden workers because companies often overlook or deny them opportunities due to gaps in their employment. These hidden workers are a largely untapped talent pool with a great deal to contribute to our society and our economy. And they can be a serious boon to employers seeking to fulfill today's staffing needs. They are diverse, and many are from groups that have been historically marginalized in the workplace or denied opportunity because of discrimination. These workers include caregivers, older workers, disabled persons, and formerly incarcerated community members who offer valuable job skills. Today, our panel of speakers will discuss some of the challenges faced when re-entering the workforce. And they will also identify valuable skills that these workers can offer employers and some solutions or promising practices to eliminating barriers in recruitment and in hiring. This discussion is particularly timely now because April marks the second chance month when we reaffirm the importance of helping those who were formerly incarcerated re-enter society. When formerly incarcerated community members find good jobs and other support, they not only promote public safety, but also break cycles of economic hardship that have long afflicted many American communities. Far too often, the more than 70 million Americans who have a prior arrest or conviction record find that those records create barriers to employment and economic stability. There's no better time than now 
to re-examine and rethink the policies and practices that create barriers to advancing equal opportunity for all workers. I look forward to our discussion, and I'll now turn it over to Director Yang to deliver her opening remarks and introduce our speaker, speakers. Thank you so much, Chair Burroughs. I am thrilled to be here with everyone to reimagine what is possible when we come together to advance equal opportunity in recruiting and hiring. The Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs is a civil rights agency within the, within the Department of Labor with 54 offices around the country. Through compliance evaluations and complaint investigations, we enforce non-discrimination and affirmative action requirements for companies doing business with the federal government. Our jurisdiction covers approximately 25,000 federal contractors, which employ about 20% of the American workforce. As our country makes major investments in our infrastructure, and as we rebuild from the pandemic, we have a critical opportunity to ensure everyone has a chance to contribute to America's economy. Today, we look forward to exploring the wealth of talent that is often hidden from employers by hiring screens that exclude highly qualified workers simply because of a period of unemployment. The bottom line is that despite a strong demand for workers, those from historically underrepresented communities are still struggling to find good jobs. And it will take all of us to address these challenges. And that's where hire comes in. OFCCP and EOC have joined forces to bring together the most impactful work to eliminate barriers to opportunity. Second Chance Month is an important time to address the actions we can take to support the 75% of formerly incarcerated people who are still unemployed a year after their release. OFCCP is renewing its commitment to link individuals with criminal histories to good jobs in the trades. Apprenticeships are a key part of the solution, and we are also collaborating with DOL's Office of Apprenticeship to promote equal opportunity. Women have been particularly hard hit from the pandemic due to caregiving responsibilities, and we are identifying practices that can support women's successful return to work after taking time off to focus on caregiving. We are partnering with DOL's Women's Bureau on these critical issues. The pandemic has also disproportionately impacted many people with disabilities, and more people are experiencing disabilities today due to long COVID as well as mental health challenges. Our colleagues at the Office of Disability Employment Policy are key partners in efforts to expand pathways to good jobs for all people with disabilities. Veterans may also face barriers to hire after time spent serving our country. We are collaborating with DOL's Veterans Employment and Training Service to ensure the skills of our veterans are recognized by employers. Today, we have an immensely knowledgeable group of leaders to help us reimagine how we can advance equal opportunity we know it's essential for us to empower and listen to workers, and we look forward to hearing from you all today. I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers. Eve Hill is the chair of the Board of Trustees for the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law and a partner at Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. Eve is one of the nation's leading disability rights experts. In February 2017, she joined Brown, Goldstein, and Levy, where she continues to advance civil rights. From 2011 to January 2017, Eve served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, where she was responsible for oversight of the division's disability rights education and Title VI enforcement, as well as the American Indian Working Group. Teresa Y. Hodge is President of Mission Launch. Teresa advocates for people with criminal convictions, criminal connections, I should correct that, a 70-month a 70 month federal prison sentence for a white collar, nonviolent, first time offense introduced her firsthand to the justice system and mass incarceration. Upon coming home, she and her daughter Lauren co founded Mission Launch Inc., a nonprofit focused on in introducing technology and entrepreneurship to previously incarcerated individuals. Additionally, the organization manages the Rebuilding Reentry Coalition, a citizen-led movement committed to creating a more just and inclusive society for returning citizens. 
Elizabeth Gedmark, Vice President of A Better Balance, joined the organization in 2011. Since 2014, she has leveraged the power of the law to help families in the South suffering from discrimination at work and to advance more family-friendly laws and policies. She is a co-author of the book, Baby Gate, How to Survive Pregnancy and Parenting in the Workplace. Elizabeth has served on the New York City Bar Sex and Law Committee and IWPR Status of Women in the South Advisory Committee and is currently serving on the Nashville Mayor's Council on Gender Equity. Heather Tinsley Fix, the Senior Advisor for Financial Resilience at AARP. She leads the organization's work on employer engagement and helps drive its focus on providing workers 50 and older with the tools they need to thrive in today's work environment. Heather works with employers and job seekers, external partners and academics to provide thought leadership on labor market issues and create practical resources that enable employers to capitalize on the value of experience. Now, let us begin. I will turn this back over to Chair Burroughs to kick us off. Thank you. Well, we'd like to start today's discussion by identifying the barriers to finding and accessing good jobs that people face when seeking to return to work after gaps in employment. And so I'll start, I think, with Elizabeth and just ask what challenges have you seen people encounter when looking for jobs or being hired after taking on extended leave to care for a loved one? Thank you, Chair Burroughs and Director Yang so much for having me and for this important conversation. And thank you to my co-panelists as well. I'm really excited about the conversation. A Better Balance runs a free and confidential legal helpline. And we have long heard from workers facing challenges looking for jobs after an extended period of caring for a loved one. And it affects disproportionately women of color, especially those in low wage jobs. The issue often starts at the very beginning with pregnancy. Uh, workers are pushed off the job when they are pregnant and need a modest accommodation to stay healthy. Something as simple as light duty or to avoid lifting heavy patients. And what many don't understand and what we've come to learn on our helpline is that this can often be the start of a downward spiral of financial insecurity. Since it can be so challenging to get a new job while pregnant or postpartum, so for example, someone who is pushed off the job while only two or three months pregnant and is unable to find another job until a few months after giving birth, then would have a resume gap of close to a year. And explaining that gap um, would require or could require disclosing that um, she is a mother, which would invite stereotyping and discrimination. And it can be incredibly difficult to rejoin the workforce after being pushed out. Um, even in this supposedly hot labor market, we've now heard from several women who are pregnant and were pushed out of multiple jobs during one pregnancy. Um, just because you can get a job doesn't mean that you can keep that job. And the challenge of being pushed out, I'm glad that you framed the question in terms of access to good jobs, because once someone has become detached from the workforce, then we hear about um, how it can be difficult to get the same level of job. So someone might go back to a new job, but all of a sudden they're not eligible for FMLA. Um, they don't meet that 12 months FMLA eligibility period since they are now a new employee, or they might've lost critical benefits, health benefits, access to short-term disability or other benefits. And we're seeing um, and hearing from so many who become independent contractors or entrepreneurs or um, are starting their own, their own business and their own income streams. But of course that means that they often are divorced from um, critical labor and civil rights protections um, for those who are employees that they might've had at that previous job. And if only they'd been able to stay attached to the workforce um, or are able to quickly re-enter, um, then some of this could have been prevented. Um, I said it started with pregnancy, but it doesn't end there. Um, we also hear on our helpline from family caregivers of all sorts, um, those who might be caring for a child with a disability, an elderly parent, a seriously ill spouse, et cetera. And having that gap on the employment, uh, gap of employment can make reentering extremely challenging and going back into their career. So for example, we've heard from so many women who have exited the workforce during the pandemic. And that's especially those who were not able to work from home. Um, because if their children were home and they were unable to work from home, then they simply could not 
make it work in order to go into the workplace. So what we hear in terms of challenges and explaining that resume gap um, is that, as I hinted at before with pregnancy, or as I said with, with pregnancy, it can often mean that there's an invitation of discrimination. The person who is on the other end of the job interview may deem that person less devoted of an employee simply because they have caregiving responsibilities, which is absolutely discrimination. And for someone who's re-entering a labor market that doesn't have the laws and policies um, at the federal level to support them that are needed, things like paid family leave and paid sick time and pregnancy accommodations, all issues that a better balance works on, um, as well as caregiver discrimination protections, many of those folks are set up to fail. And some don't even bother applying to jobs that they perceive as being unfriendly to caregivers, because why would you go through all of that if you're only going to face discrimination? Um, and I, I will say that all of these issues have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And I am based in the South, I would say, especially here in the South, where sometimes we do have labor, weaker labor protections. Um, and I also wanted to quickly mention that there are unique challenges for different populations. Um, as was said in the opening remarks, this is not a monolithic population. And just one example, um, we heard from our top line of a woman in a rural area. She faced discrimination early on in the, in the pandemic and was pushed out and then had, still has not been able to find a job. In her small town, she felt that she was probably being um, blocked, that her employer was talking to others and was basically blocking her from employment. Transportation can also be a particular barrier for rural communities. And one last quick note, um, I know that one of my co-panelists will be speaking about disability, um, and I did want to mention that there may be other caregiving um, or self-care issues, even if there's not a technical disability, um, someone may have something like a serious medical issue. Um, and I'll, I'll wrap up my comments since I know we need to be brief. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very, very important issues that you've raised. Uh, for Heather Tinley Fix, I would like to ask, what barriers do you see for older workers who may be seeking to re-enter the workforce in accessing good jobs? Thank you so much, uh, Chair Burroughs and Director Yang for having me, and um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, in terms of older workers and the barriers that they face in uh, re-entering the workforce, we know from research that uh, if an older worker experiences an involuntary separation, from the workforce, whether that is through layoffs or the, the mass sort of, you know, uh, pandemic layoffs that, that took place way back in the beginning of the pandemic, it takes them about twice as long to get back into the workforce than it does for younger workers to do so. And, uh, and the Urban Institute showed this a couple of years ago too, and Elizabeth alluded to this, that only 10% of those older workers regain the salaries that they had had prior to that separation. So older workers definitely do face some barriers in terms of once they have a gap on their um, record or their resume, getting back in. And there can be a lot of reasons for this. So um, one is that you know competing and applying for jobs has changed a lot in recent years. The whole process now takes place online, at least for you know a lot of bigger businesses and through a multitude of different platforms. So uh, one of the most, um, one of the biggest changes is that job applicants need to have several versions of their resume now. You know, you almost have to tailor your resume for each job you apply for, and that's, that's new. Um, they may have to take assessments or play games as part of the process. That can be part of the um, application process. They may conduct some of the interviews via video. Um, and a lot of times video interviewing is asynchronous. So you're given a set of questions, you record yourself answering them, and then you send them in. So you're not even really interacting with uh, someone on Zoom. Um, and so depending on how long it's been since you applied for a job from outside of a company, rather than say, moving around internally and leveraging your network, you may be unfamiliar with these kinds of processes. And even a small number of missteps can trigger those automated filters, those you know immediate rejections that I'm sure we're all aware of, because a lot of times this is um, you know outsourced to algorithms. So it, it may be that um, unwittingly, without meaning to, uh, the algorithms have been set up to uh, you know weed out people just for small missteps uh, due to unfamiliarity. Um, Another element of competing for jobs these days is an applicant's presence and activity on social media, particularly LinkedIn and then other um, professional forums. 
So there's, you know, the activity itself. Are you posting? Are you sharing relevant content? Do you belong to groups? And so on. But then there's also the visual aspect. Um, your picture is there. Uh, and so this also applies to video interviewing as well. There can be uh, this um, an unconscious bias that creeps in when people can see your photograph or see you on, on screen. And so that leads me to my final point, which is that probably the biggest, most sort of widespread barrier that underpins all of this is that ageism and age discrimination remain stubbornly with us. Uh, and unfortunately, it's distressingly common. In 2020, AARP conducted research uh, sort of during the height of the pandemic that revealed that 78% of workers over the age of 40 had either seen or had, had experienced age discrimination at work. And that's the highest rate we've seen since we started tracking this metric. Uh, the last time we uh, measured it was in 2018, and it was you know 61% of workers over the age of 40. So it really leapt up during the pandemic. And we also know that uh, when you overlay age with other aspects of identity, so older women, um, older LGBTQ people, um, that those uh, instances of a discrimin age discrimination are higher. Uh, so it really is just a, you know, there's a lot, there's unconscious ageism that sort of is in our culture that um, is pervasive and it's, uh, it's something that we, we see uh, distressingly and is a barrier for older workers to getting back into the workforce. Thank you. Um, so I'll go to next to Eve Hill. Do individuals who have disabilities face some of these similar barriers? And i um, really interested to hear from you about the impact in particular maybe that the pandemic has had on employment prospects for individuals with issues related to long COVID or mental impairments. Well, thank you for having me. And my answer is nah, we're all good, no problem. Um, no, as you might expect that a gap in, in work history for people with disabilities lays on top of and exacerbates the discrimination that people with disabilities face in the workforce already. So what we're seeing a lot now is people developing a new disability or having their existing previously invisible disability exacerbated often by the pandemic. So the, pan the isolation of the pandemic and the different stressors that people have faced during the pandemic has increased as we've all read in the news, uh, mental health conditions and concerns over mental health. And so people are needing to take time off to address those concerns, to get treatment and treatment for mental health conditions takes a while to figure out what will work. So if, these, if, if they come back, try to come back to work, if they've lost their jobs, coming back is, is faces another barrier. The other thing that's happened in the pandemic is new disabilities like long COVID. And this is new to everyone. It's new to the medical profession. So they're taking a great deal of time to try and identify it, figure out how to diagnose it. It's variable across different people, so you, it, you don't recognize it right away, and yet it impacts people's ability to work uh, quite significantly. At the same time, people are having these new disabilities or exacerbated disabilities. They used to have, their disabilities used to be invisible, now they have to request accommodations, which often leads, even if the person doesn't need time off, leads to their existing employer going, oh no, we didn't hire you with a disability. We, we don't like disabilities. You're gonna be a cost to us in, in terms of reasonable accommodation, or you're gonna be a cost to us in terms of our health insurance or whatever it is. And they may lose their jobs <clears throat> just, when the, just for revealing their disability and seeking accommodation. So these are creating these gaps in, in people's resumes. And then even in this time when employers say they're looking for talent, they're not looking for this talent in a lot of cases. So the ADA recognizes that employers often bear a good deal of prejudice against people with disabilities and therefore prohibits employers from asking, do you have a disability? What is your disability? Anything that's really designed to find out if an, if an applicant has a disability. But this gap in a resume may be a hole in that prohibition. Now, I will not accept that it's a hole, so, <laughs> so be prepared. But I can tell that employers are going to argue, I'm not asking about disability, I'm asking about the gap in your resume, and that's legit, legitimate. And I would say, well, that's 
it's likely to reveal a disability and therefore should be prohibited. But employers are going to be asking these questions that are going to force people to reveal disabilities that they wouldn't have to otherwise. And that creates what I call the waterfall of prejudice, the fear of the disability. Uh, people continue to have tremendous prejudice and fear about people with mental health conditions, completely unjustified. They fear that people with disabilities, particularly those who have taken some time off from work, will be unreliable employees. Again, completely unjustified. And they fear that either reasonable accommodation costs will be unreasonable or that health insurance costs will go up as they'll get rated by their insurance providers, all of which are, are demonstrated not to be true. But those fears come up in an employer's uh, mind right quickly. They don't even recognize it. And that person is rejected before anyone even knows. People then think, oh, well, Social Security takes care of those people, right? And uh, Social Security does not, in fact, take care of people. There is really not much of a safety net for people with disabilities any more than there is for caregivers or older people. Um, most applications for Social Security disability are denied, um, no matter what your disability is. And it can take years to be approved anyway, all of which time you're living on nothing. <laughs> Um, and you don't get Medicare for two years. So all of that time, a person with disability is going without health care, uh, all of which exacerbates and makes it more difficult to go back to work. So we've got sort of a, a domino effect happening here for people with disabilities. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's go to Teresa. What challenges do formerly incarcerated persons face when they attempt to return to the workforce? Yeah, so first, uh, Chair Burroughs and Director Gang, thank you also for this really important and timely conversation and including people with conviction histories um, in this conversation. If we haven't already been depressed by Elizabeth, Heather, and Eve, then, you know, I'm getting ready to come in and to lair because when you think of more than 70 million Americans who have an arrest or conviction record and who for sure have a gap in their employment, they... Um, represent these other identities. And, you know, they are also people with disabilities, people who are over 50, um, people who have stayed home for a, a variety of reasons or who have some kind of health care or um, mental disability that they're um, dealing with. So for me, the negative effects of a conviction rarely ends for a person when they've completed their sentence. It, it's a complex web of local and state um, uh, statues that keep people locked out of opportunity. What we have found is it's the criminal background check itself um, that keeps people locked out of opportunity. And this is not just individuals who maybe have been home five or 10, I mean, have come home five days ago. This could be five, 10, 20 years later, a person is still dealing with this issue. This is because nine out of 10 employers run a criminal background check. And the criminal background check provides us with stale data. It is a, an, an important piece of information, but it's only one piece of information. As individuals, we are dynamic every day. We have an opportunity to improve our lives, but this one single piece of data is denying people access to opportunity. And so for us, we have found that it is um, an expanded view of not only a gap in a resume, but being able to look at who is this person today, what employers who hire individuals with arrest or conviction workers will tell you is that they are a ready, dedicated workforce. Dedicated because no one wants to go back out and start that process over and over again. And for so many people, when they do have to change jobs or the pandemic hits and they're out of work, even if they had 10, 20 years of employment history, once again, they're having to answer about that criminal history 10, 20 years ago. Um, we can ban the box. We can you know, remove uh, from applications the box that says, have you ever been convicted of a crime? But there are other ways that later along in the process, that employers find out that a person has an arrest or conviction record. And when they do, because they don't know how to assess the individual, it's just easier to say no and to move on. 
I think there is an opportunity we have today uh, with the infrastructure bill um, having passed with an, in a post COVID world where employers are looking for talent to tap into this uh, ready uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. What we have heard from some employers is that during the pandemic, they relaxed their policies for getting backgrounds um, and just went off of the fact that they needed bodies. And what they have said privately is that people are performing very well. But now that it's easy to get background checks again, because during the pandemic, it was hard, we're back to some of the old ways of doing business. So the opportunity to reimagine, what does it look like when we provide second chances and how do we interpret gaps of employment, but also the fact that all of us are better than our worst mistake and none of us want to ever be judged by that mistake every time we go to apply for opportunity. Well, thank you for that. And I'll turn now to Director Yang. Well, thank you all so much. Um, as employers search to find workers, there's been considerable interest in skills-based hiring, which focuses on practical job-relevant skills. Many workers with resume gaps have valuable skills, some often gained during their period of leave. My question uh, for each of you is, what skills do the workers you advocate for offer employers to fill, fulfill their organizational goals? And let's start with Eve. How have you seen people with dis disabilities effectively highlight their skills? Well, I have, we have actually a good deal of experience because employers, some employers um, like Walgreens have really focused on hiring people with disabilities. And so they've been able to show what people with disabilities bring to the table, just even as a broad category of people. So people with disabilities bring a level of loyalty that, that the employers were stun stunned to find. They had started with ridiculous levels of turnover. It seemed that, I, I couldn't do the math, but it seemed that everybody left within the course of a year. And that dropped precipitously to almost nobody left anymore once the people with disabilities were on. And they create loyalty among their co-employees. So it was really amazing. It, they led to increases, improvements in safety. There were fewer accidents, partly because the people with disabilities were being very careful, but also partly because of the accommodations that were put in place for them. There were clearer, simpler signs, for example, reminding people to lift with your legs and not with your back. And so people did, and they had fewer uh, injuries and to watch out for things that were tripping hazards, all those kinds of things fed into the profit of the company, quite honestly. And then people with disabilities, if you want soft skills like problem solving, people with disabilities solve more problems before they get to work than most of us do in a week. So just figuring out how to get public transportation to get you to work on time is a major problem solving feat for many people with disabilities. And they figure that out and they don't brag about it and they don't whine about it, even though I totally would. Um, so these are things that people with disabilities bring to the table. And then people with disabilities bring whatever they bring to the table. They're individuals and they learn all kinds of things unrelated to their disability. And we just don't think about it the right way. So I know a, a blind astrophysicist. And you know why it's actually a benefit to be blind if you're going to be an astrophysicist? You can't see this stuff. So she doesn't have to translate it into something you could talk about in a visual way and then back into astrophysics physics talk. She can take it originally um, and then just translate it for the sight of people. We don't think about how people accommodate themselves as being a benefit to us. And yet it really is. So um, people with disabilities bring all those things to the table. And then getting along with folks, they people with disabilities face discrimination and help educate people over it on a daily basis. They know how to deal with people who are uncomfortable with how they look in a way that's not in your face and obnoxious. So of course, they're going to be able to deal with the, the Karen down the hallway from you who is a little bit obnoxious without having to get anyone fired or, or start a big fight. So there are lots of things we bring to the table, all of which we overlook in our waterfall of prejudice. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Eve, for those really helpful insights and practical and actionable ideas. Let me turn it to Teresa. How have you seen those um, who have experienced incarceration frame their history and skills to find employment? Yeah. So speaking of a creative group, um, for many um, individuals, when we're incarcerated, we don't stop working. Um, we, for the most part, we're running the prison facility where we are currently being housed. And so there are skill sets that people learn. Um, in some cases, they are able to further their education, um, depending on where they're housed. And then also they're able to pick up a lot of uh, traits while they're in prison. You know, one of the big problems is often when they come home, they're unable to get the license to actually go to work in some of those trades. So, you know, that's um, one of the things that I'm seeing. This population is not a monolithic. There are a lot of people who take really good skill sets with them to prison. I went to prison a little later in life. And so I had a 20 year career um, and good business skills that I took to prison. I knew I could come back home and work through and find um, employment. But that's not necessarily the case for everyone. There are some people who, like I said, they're getting their GED, they're getting a trade. But what I can tell you is soft skills, strong problem solving, 100%, very entrepreneurial, innovative, something that a lot of corporations like to have are people who can help solve problems, see new opportunities for them. Um, and what a lot of employers will tell you, they are dedicated, they are loyal, they are committed, they come on time, they are the first ones there. They leave late because they are committed to this. So when we're looking for talent, this is a talent that if we can get over and find ways to assess the background check, this is a talent pool that can help employers really grow their business. Well, thanks so much, Teresa, for really highlighting both the um, skill set as well as the commitment for those who have experienced incarceration. Heather, let's talk about older workers. Many have more experience um, in the workforce. Some are returning after a period of retirement. What should employers know about hiring older workers? Well, I, um, I love answering this question uh, because older workers have so much to offer uh, their employers. And uh, the things that I'm gonna talk about are things that my fellow panelists have also said. There's a, a lot of similarity. So first, you know, older workers have the specific experience and the knowledge that they've developed over the longer course of their careers, whether that's in manufacturing or healthcare or engineering or professional services. They have, you know, their specific set of experience. Um, and then secondly, um, again, with this refrain, they have a lot of soft skills. We surveyed employers on this point and found that among the soft skills most important to them, a majority say that workers age 50 plus have an advantage over their under 30 counterparts, uh, leading the way in work ethic and professionalism in management and leadership and mentoring and coaching. Soft skills are certainly rising in importance um, and in demand because they're the kind of skills that are not easily automatable. And they tend to be the ones that take some time to develop. So things like critical thinking and analysis, um, the ability to communicate effectively, empathy and relationship building, um, you know, the ability to read a room, the ability to make sound judgments and sound decisions. So um, the, uh, the soft skills are really um, a lot of what employer, employers can count on older workers for. And then the last thing I wanna mention is kind of the uh, secret sauce when you combine this specific uh, set of professional or industrial knowledge, industry knowledge with those soft skills and you get what I like to call, well, what, what we might call tacit knowledge, right? Older workers have so much tacit and contextual knowledge that's been built up over years of experience. And if you, one good way to think about this is that explicit knowledge is easy to translate. It's easy to transmit from one person to another. You can document it. Uh, tacit knowledge is harder. It's something that has to be passed on through um, being together, uh, through a mentoring or a coaching uh, relationship. So uh, a good analogy that I like to use is that an example of explicit knowledge is a recipe, like a recipe for bread. Um, tacit knowledge is the stuff that's harder to translate, which is when do you stop kneading the dough? That is a, a, you know, that's a kind of specialized knowledge that is built up over time. And older workers are rich in this kind of tacit knowledge and it's, um, it's a great asset to employers. 
Well, thanks so much, Heather, for highlighting that. It's very interesting that everyone has highlighted the importance of soft skills. Elizabeth, um, have you seen a shift for caregivers, you know, with uh, some employers moving to um, more inclusive practices? Well, I think that um, caregivers, unfortunately, the very incredibly difficult work of caregiving uh, remains quite undervalued in our society. Um, and unfortunately, especially by um, lawmakers and, and stakeholders and a lot of those who are making the decisions, um, and I'll be frank, caregiving is historically marginalized due to sexism and racism in our society. Um, so it's, of course, why we need better laws and policies that that recognize how important caregiving is to our society so that you don't face punishment after periods of time spent doing this work. Um, so many caregivers gain incredible skills and knowledge while they are caregiving. Um, and they also learn many important values that would be really helpful for employers. Um, so obviously there are some skills that would directly translate. Um, we have heard from a mom of young children who then could obviously go and work in childcare, um, caring for young children. Um, we've heard from folks who might be a caregiver for um, an elderly loved one, and then of course could become something like a nurse's aide um, or a father who has a child with an autism diagnosis, and then may be able to help other parents navigate um, a similar diagnosis. Um, I wanted to give an example of a father because of course these stereotypes, um, stereotyping can affect men just as much as women who men are sometimes punished for caregiving since that is not deemed to be um, something that men quote unquote should do. Um, and then there are also other transferable skills. So um, we've spoken to so many amazing caregivers who have learned how to be advocates, for example, um, because they have had to learn how to speak up for a loved one in a healthcare setting um, or for their child to get the proper education at school. Um, I remember we heard from one mom who was spending so much on um, parking fees at the NICU, you know, where she had to be every day for her baby for months on end. Um, she organized and advocated and they changed their policy at the hospital so that NICU parents no longer had to pay for their parking fees and that those parents were able to be there with their babies. Um, one employer wouldn't want that person on their team, right? That is just such an amazing example and obviously would be transferable to advocating for a client or a customer. Um, and uh, another example that many of us might recognize, we spoke with a woman um, who, she was actually pushed out of the job due to her own disability in the beginning of the pandemic, um, and then has been helping her son with virtual schooling for the last couple of years. And virtual schooling, those parents have had to learn a different link for every class and a different platform and different homework. Um, so that has required such detail-oriented skills um, that would transfer and, and make sure that someone knows how to um, be very detail-oriented in their work. Um, and then I wanted to emphasize as well values that are learned. It's not just concrete skills, but um, caregivers learn patience. Um, diligence, resilience. Um, it can be so hard with no time off um, that caregiving and these folks oftentimes are overcoming so much. Um, and, and time management as well, um, which is a skill as well as, as can be thought of as a, a value. Um, think of someone, you know, we hear all the time from people who are having to navigate um, multiple different doctor's appointments, different doctor's offices, um, different healthcare systems, insurance, all of those phone calls and those details and the paperwork, um, and that can be extremely difficult work, um, and a lot of lessons are learned from that. Um, so there are just so many people who the caregiving is difficult work. It's not just time off. Um, it's just difficult work that is unpaid. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for highlighting those really critical skill sets that caregivers have. Um, I'll turn it back to Chair Burroughs for our next set of questions. Thank you all. Well, thank you. And now that we've discussed the various skill sets that these workers bring and some of the challenges they've had, I'm an optimist. So I think it's time to focus on solutions that remove barriers to recruitment and hiring. And I'm really interested to hear about promising practices or strategies to promote the recruitment and hiring of individuals who may have gaps in employment um, seeking to re-enter the workforce. So for each of you, do you have advice on how employers can find, attract, and retain these workers? And I think I will um, start with Heather. 
Great. Well, um, the first thing I want to mention is that AARP actually has a job board um, where employers can post jobs. And are, if they're looking for older workers, um, it's a job board that we market to our constituency and to the 50 plus, um, although anybody can apply for a job on the AARP job board. Um, and you can reach that by going to aarp.org slash jobs. So that's one way is to source older workers from specialty job boards like ours that are, um, you know, that have a group of uh, constituents that are, are in that category. Um, another good way to source older workers is actually to leverage the older workers in your organization and ask them for referrals. You know, networking is still the best, one of the best ways to, uh, to get hired and to get a job. And so um, finding older workers through the networks in your own organization is another, another good way. Um, another thing it's, that's important to do in terms of attracting an, um, an older applicant pool is you wanna take a look at your hiring process. Look at all the elements um, in it. So is it an age inclusive process? For example, look at your job descriptions. Do they are they peppered with phrases like digital native, recent college grad? Um, those are sort of more obvious, um, you know, ageist types of language. But do, do they say things like, you know, fast paced, high energy, um, you know, those kinds of things that may subtly, subtly um, indicate to older workers that they're, you know, they might as well not bother to apply. Um, what about your employer branding? You know, what when you, you know, on your careers page, do you have any images of older workers as part of the mix? Um, what about your interview panels? Uh, when you have, if you have interview panels, do you have a good mix of diversity on them, including people who are older? So the hiring process in all of its stages um, is something to take a look at in terms of improving your ability to attract uh, and hire older workers. Um, speaking of the hiring process, another thing you can do is really to drive awareness of this topic with your hiring managers. Um, you know, DEI professionals, HR folks, they probably don't need convincing, you know, on this point because they're champions of diversity, but you may want to remind hiring managers that age diversity is good for business. We have a lot of resources on this for um, employers uh, talking about the business case for older workers and also for age diversity. So um, you can really encourage your hiring managers to check their own assumptions. Um, do they have any unconscious biases? It's uh, ageism is one of the sort of last acceptable prejudices. Um, it's easy to make jokes uh, about you know senior moments or whatever, and so maybe their uh, it, it's you know maybe their bias is unconscious. So just having them be aware of that when they're about to um, you know hire into a position on their team, encourage them to to check that type of, of bias. Uh, in terms of retaining older workers, uh, flexibility is the name of the game. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic has really, uh, you know, made this a much more pervasive tactic now for uh, attracting and retaining uh, highly talented people. So, uh, but there are a couple of things you can do specifically to bring back older, older folks into the workforce. Um, returnships are one way to, to bring people back in. It's a great way to provide a, um, a, a getting to know you period for both the worker and the um, organization to see if it's a good fit. Um, flexible Flexibility in terms of place. So remote work is very popular um, with everyone uh, and including older workers as well. Um, and then it, it, are there ways that you can offer um, flexibility in terms of time? Like do you have part-time positions or um, you may want to bring back older workers as consultants. So providing that flexibility um, really uh, makes um, coming back into the workforce attractive to older workers. So there's lots of ways to, to, to retain older workers. And um, you can find a lot of these types of resources at aarp.org forward slash employers. Well, thank you. And I'll go now to Eve. What do you have to tell us about how employers can find, attract, and retain workers with disabilities? Yeah, um, there are lots of ways because people with disabilities are everywhere. Um, so one of the things to really do is to be open about being inclusive. So first be inclusive and then talk about how inclusive you are. And ways to do that include highlighting your employees with disabilities and what amazing contributions they make to your workforce. And, and, and in highlighting your C-suite commitment to these issues. This is one of the things that encourages people to join your company and that encourages people to stay with your company and that encourages people to be open about their disability identities is if your top leadership 
keep saying, this is important to us. We really care about this. Um, and then reach out. Targeted outreach is important, both to if you're hiring college grads, uh, reach out to the disability student offices. And they can be places where they just put the job ads up. And that indicates that you actually want to hire people with disabilities. Target uh, outreach to disability organizations and uh, different uh, health group organizations. And then make sure there aren't barriers to bringing people on. So you could be doing a lot of great outreach, but then have barriers that block people at the interview stage or at the job description stage. So one of the things we have to have to do is look at all our job descriptions and make sure they don't have physical and other requirements that screen out people with disabilities. So we, we somehow have a lot of old job descriptions that say must be capable of lifting 50 pounds. Yeah, no, most of us are not doing that. We're, if we're doing it at all, we're using a machine to do it. We've got a lot of things, uh, job descriptions that say must be able to see out of both eyes when it's actually not required. You've got a lot of uh, job descriptions that say must have a driver's license or be able to drive when no, the, what you have to be able to do is get around to different places. You have to drive there yourself. Um, so really looking at those with an eye to, is this really necessary the way we've written it? What is really the important part? It's very important. And then get into the hiring process. Make sure the people who do your hiring have disability implicit bias training so that they're not carrying that around. People don't recognize that they have it. So training them out of that's very important and make sure that their accommodations are ready when needed. You can't be saying, having a, a person with a disability ask for an accommodation and say, oh, I'm gonna have to get back to you in a couple weeks because hiring moves fast these days. Um, and you, you don't have that kind of time and neither does that person. So prepare for people with disabilities to show up because we will, and then have your accommodations ready to go. Then keeping for, pe for keeping people, include disability in your diversity statements. It's often left out. And in all your DEI statements and programs, just include it all. It, we fit in, we're, we're intersectional, <laughs> we're everywhere. Um, and so that's something you really should focus on. And then keeping people requires being ready to accommodate them. And the best practice is to centralize your accommodations process. So no supervisor feels like, oh, I can't afford to hire this person because the cost of the accommodation will come out of my budget. That should never be any supervisor's concern. Any paying for accommodations, not that they're very expensive, should come out of a centralized budget. And then things like mentoring and other professional development opportunities often don't happen naturally for people with disabilities because we people, well, people, you, people without disabilities are not used to being around us. So it, we don't just fall into conversation and that kind of relationship. So make those things happen, force them a little bit. Um, they work fine once you get over that initial, oh, I don't know how to do this. I'm afraid I'll mess it up and say the wrong thing barrier. So create those opportunities. And then like Heather said, flexibility in terms of place and in terms of time is really important. The pandemic has taught, has taught the rest of the world a lot that people with disabilities already knew. I could do my job from anywhere. I could do my job from 10 at night until four in the morning. Um, I'm, as long as I get it done within a 24 hour period, it's okay. Whereas when people with disabilities used to ask for that kind of flexibility, we would say, no, 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 that can't be done. We know now that it can be done. So keep having that, that level of flexibility and you'll keep having employees with disabilities. Well, thank you so much. And um, Teresa Hodge, uh, tell us, what do you think employers can do to find, attract and retain workers with this, uh, you know, who are coming back into society after a period of incarceration? So I feel like we're all kind of saying the same thing, but just a little different. And so diversity, equity, and inclusion is really about your intention to be inclusive. Um, and so one of the things that you can do is state that you are a fair chance or a second chance employer. That all by itself is a welcoming sign that it, it's okay to come here and apply for a job. No one wants to be told over, no, over and over and over again that they're not welcomed after they go through the daunting process of applying. 
Um, choose a background um, vendor that provides additional data points beyond the fact that a person has a criminal history. You're looking for context. Um, train your HR and your uh, talent acquisition team on how to have the conversation when it's time to talk about the fact that a person has arrest or a conviction record and make sure that you're doing it with empathy so that the person is comfortable freely sharing with you this information that allows you maybe to get over the hump and to bring this individual in. I also um, would encourage employers to review their job descriptions and maybe update them. You know, decide which jobs are the jobs that they feel are anyone can come in and work. And if there's some jobs that they're not sure about, I would suggest that they hire a professional that works specifically with this population to help them be sure that you can't hire someone with a conviction history. And if so, then get really specific about that. And only deny employment when it makes sense and be willing, again, to engage outside individuals who are used to expanding opportunity for individuals with arrest or conviction records. And like everyone else, if you hire people with arrest or conviction records, they will be a great referral, a resource to you to engage and to bring you other good, ready talent. And when it comes to retaining this population, um, like everyone else said, you have to be flexible. And sometimes with this particular population, it may mean that they might be on probation and parole. And probation and parole are going to want to see them during the working hours, unfortunately. And if that is the case, then just being flexible and making sure that if they come in a little early or work a little later or if the, you're flexible with the timing of when the work gets done, that you just accommodate that. Um, be fair in your pay structure, your benefits package, how you mentor and promote this talent. You know, don't have pay scales that keep them in, locked into certain positions, but give them opportunity to grow and be a part of your company. And then last, I think for all of us, we just want to feel like we belong. And if you don't isolate these individuals, if you make them feel like they are a part of your team, what I know for a fact is you will be able to retain them and they will help you grow your business. Thank you, that's terrific. So Elizabeth, any last thoughts with respect to uh, finding, attracting, retaining talent uh, with respect to caregivers? Well, what I would say um, we hear from workers are stories of discrimination against caregivers um, at each of these stages, the job posting, the interview, and then once on the job. Um, and my co-panelists have touched on a lot of this. Um, one, I wanted to mention an example in job postings or the application process is around availability. Um, so we have heard from many folks who say, it, what I've been told is if I don't check that I'm available every single day for every single time period, then I'm only gonna get eight hours a week. And what I really need is I need 30, I need 40 so that I can afford my bills. Um, so, you know, that's sort of, you know, availability and that expectation that someone will always be available, um, that can be a real barrier. Um, we have also heard of in the interview stage, um, even comments as, you know, blatantly discriminatory is, well, why don't you just come back once you've had your baby? Um, why don't you just reapply a little bit later once your family situation has calmed down, things like that. Um, and then um, also heard from folks that, you know, are they really asking me what I've been doing in the last two years? It's been a global unprecedented pandemic. You know, what do you think? What do they think that I've been doing? Do I actually have to provide explanation for that? Um, and then on the job, um, you know, again, in terms of discrimination against caregivers, things like, well, why can't your wife just take your son to the doctor's appointments or um, an unwillingness to provide um, even very reasonable and meaningful um, accommodations as some of my co-panelists have, have mentioned. Um, and the one thing I did just want to mention, um, kind of re was that we hear from folks who they feel like they're being punished for caring for their families um, and, for, and that that was not a valuable contribution to society when it was. And when people feel like that, or if they feel like it's a hostile environment, they simply won't apply. Um, they just will not even um, give you the chance to show them um, so I, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear um, and that, of course, employers can support better laws and policies so that everyone is on an equal footing um, in terms of making sure that employees feel confident that they'll have what they need so that they can apply for jobs and be successful in the workplace. 
regardless of their caregiving uh, needs. Thank you for that. And I do want to make clear, although I hope everyone realizes this, that telling someone that because they've had just had a child or they're pregnant, uh, they won't be hired is a clear violation of our statutes. And obviously, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission would take that seriously. And you can reach out to us on, you know, the, the contact information is at www.eoc.gov. Had to say that um, clearly. Uh, but beyond that, I think to continue the conversation, I'll turn it over to Director Yang, but I do hear some themes here, the importance of flexibility, um, love that they're this, these creative ideas and some of them fairly straightforward with respect to, um, you know, going to the job boards, going to the places where um, the civil rights community and others that uh, help these particular populations can be a conduit to it and of course really appreciate the flag with respect to proceeding with empathy uh director yang well i really appreciate everyone's insights on actionable solutions are there practices employers organizations that place workers or assist job seekers should avoid to increase opportunities for workers with gaps in employment history and let's start with you, Teresa. What employment practices do you recommend be avoided? Um, I think that you should get to know the individual when they walk in, give them an opportunity to have a human um, interaction with you before you dig into the criminal history. Is this a person who you would want to hire? Just continue to delay that process so that you can make a decision and you have some data points of your own to go off of. Um, I just think that um, asking someone, running the background check early on is denying today about a third of the population access to opportunity without you having an opportunity to first get to know them. I think it's one of the best ways that employers can fill um, vacancies and have access to this talent pool and avoid some of the bias. Well, thank you so much, Teresa, for that really important um, recommendation. Elizabeth, what uh, practices do you recommend should be avoided? I alluded to some of them in the previous question, um, but I did also want to mention for um, state and local agencies, it's really important. Um, we have heard of um, something like a state unemployment office or Department of Labor sort of steering folks away from particular careers or particular directions based on what they think might be good or bad um, given someone's caregiving status, um, which can really limit opportunities and could be um, even illegal as, as you mentioned, Chair Burroughs. Um, and then also for those who are helping job seekers, um, it could be really helpful to practice interview questions where someone is explaining a resume gap and is explaining um, the skills that they would develop or the values um, and are also able to um, address head on what might be a stereotypical um, assumption and saying that actually, of course, I am a really, you know, reliable and um, determined employee. Um, and the, the one other thing I would mention that we have heard from workers um, who the interview has not matched the practice in the interview, they're promised flexibility and accommodations and um, a welcoming environment, and then actually on the job, um, that simply won't come true. And the expectation is completely different from what was promised in the interview, which um, obviously is very concerning. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Heather, what, do you, what have you seen in terms of employer practices? I know you highlighted a few earlier on what uh, to avoid, but what are some other opportunities you see for both employers as well as those who help workers find employment um, could avoid? So uh, one of the first things that uh, I wanna bring up is asking for age, basically asking for date of birth or date of graduation in your application process. Now this is a bit of a dilemma because if you're able to use a vendor that has really blind hiring, <clears throat> excuse me, so they hide all the characteristics of the applicants from you until sort of the last stage of interviewing. Then, you know, just to be able to have the data to show that you're improving your, um, you know, diversity hiring and a bunch of different fronts, including age, then maybe it makes sense, you know, to have age as a um, something that's being tracked. But in the, in the main, I would say, you know, you really don't want your hiring managers, your HR folks, or anyone to know in the hiring process to know what the age of your applicants are, in addition to other 
characteristics. I, um, blind hiring is just a great way to improve diversity. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is you want to check with your vendors if you are, again, working with applicant tracking systems. Are there filters that are set to exclude people with gaps in their resume? Or are there filters that are uh, set to exclude people who don't have a degree? You know, this emphasis on skills-based hiring is um, exciting and new, uh, but there's like a lot of legacy processes in place that are sort of dependent on that degree. So are is there something just automatic that's happening that you can turn those filters off? Uh, so you wanna avoid having um, like actively screening that out based, actively screening candidates out based on all the things we're talking about here. Um, and then the last thing, and I know that um, my panelists, other panelists have alluded to this is, are your job descriptions like stuffed with nice to haves? Um, it's so uh, important that, you know, we used to, I think we really used to focus on job descriptions as what is our ideal candidate look like? And do they have all of this, uh, you know, experience and skills? With a labor market this tight, I think employers are more open to just being sort of brutally focused on what does this role require? What are the skills or experience, uh, specific experience uh, that are needed? Um, and then even, there's even some talk, um, you know, when I go to conferences and so on, of can we find someone with like three quarters of these skills, right? And then we can um, use our internal training and development programs to kind of bring them up to speed on the rest of it. So I think thinking creatively um, and hiring for adaptability, for mindset, for the ability to learn is, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm answering in the affirmative rather than what you should not do, but um, don't, don't stuff your job descriptions with lots and lots of uh, nice to haves, because that ends up just excluding lots of great candidates for your roles. Well, thanks so much, Heather. Um, I think those are really helpful, uh, concrete suggestions. Eve, um, I know you have many examples of problematic hiring practices and also wanted to get your view. I know a lot of people use the term uh, blind hiring, but might you suggest other terms that could be used to um, avoid ableist language in, in uh, those processes as well? Yeah, um, I would just say that it, it's, it would be neutral hiring that doesn't focus on the different aspects of the person. Uh, so I, I think my advice is really like a lot of people, don't use job descriptions and hiring practices based on the 1950 standard of an employee. <laughs> we are not there anymore. You are not hiring that person anymore. And then don't also don't do hiring based on who your current employees are and who they know. That will get you more of the same and it will continue to leave out the people who are different and who bring different things to the table, differences that you need. And I'm very concerned right now that employers are actually going to make that worse in a way by incorporating artificial intelligence, which is gonna take from you, what do you think a good employee is? You'll look around and say, ah, this and this and this among my current good employees, and you're gonna get more of your current good employees, but none of the other good employees who came through a different way, who have different backgrounds, who bring different things to the table. So I'm concerned that instead of opening the field up, AI may concretize <laughs> uh, the old ways of doing things. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Thanks so much, Eve. I know many of those uh, suggestions and others, they, re they really help all communities, right? To make sure we're not perpetuating practices that simply recreate personal characteristics of people in the current job, as opposed to uh, the really wide field of talent that have the skills and abilities necessary to perform the job. So thank you all for sharing those, um, highlighting some practices that um, we should consider avoiding in order to expand the talent pool. And I will turn it back to Chair Burroughs. Well, thank you. And I appreciate uh, Eve Hill raising the issue of artificial intelligence or those smart technologies that are starting to automate some hiring processes. They can, of course, be helpful in some circumstances, but um, particularly with respect to disability, but also a host of other characteristics, uh, there's a need to really have some safeguards to make sure they don't inadvertently become high-tech pathways to discrimination. Um, 
and we at the EOC and I know of CCP as well are really uh, interested in those uh, issues along these lines also. Um, the last couple of questions have primarily focused on employers. So I think it's helpful to discuss how applicants with employment gaps may want to approach the job search. So I would like to ask, do you have suggestions or tips for these individuals to consider when seeking and applying for jobs? And I'll start with Elizabeth. What about caregivers? Yes, thank you so much. Um, so for all the caregivers out there, what I would start with is know your rights. Um, I'm gonna put it in the chat, but A Better Balance has um, a workplace rights hub um, and a free and confidential legal helpline where we can help you talk through your rights. So if you have a big job interview coming up and you're very concerned about um, what uh, might be your rights going into that conversation, what are appropriate questions and how to handle them, um, we can talk to you. So. Um, an example I alluded to earlier, um, and these are not just federal rights, but also state and local, which could be a bit more protective than federal under certain circumstances. Um, what I alluded to earlier with staffing agencies is that we have talked to folks about if someone asks, um, you know, is your family situation under control um, over the last couple of years, um, you know, or for someone who is newly married, a question about, are you going to start a family? Um, then um, sometimes you can focus instead on, I think what you're asking me is if I'm going to be a dedicated employee and the answer I can give you is absolutely a resounding yes, because of all of these reasons, X, Y, and Z. So sort of trying to flip it because obviously in an interview, um, it could be quite awkward to um, call someone out. Um, so trying to flip it like that. Um, if so, if there's a direct question that you know is not appropriate, saying just, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that question, um, and then answering, you know, in the sort of pivoted the way that um, that might feel much more comfortable to you, so that then um, you're not putting them on the spot. Um, but then also take notes, because um, if there is evidence of discrimination, then that would be important to know. Um, so you want to try and make sure that you're not at risk of uh, discrimination. The other thing I would say is don't be scared to talk about the non-traditional work that you might've been doing. We hear from so many who um, maybe they've stepped away from their, uh, what was sort of their career beforehand, but they have been doing babysitting and house cleaning, yard work, um, you know, sewing, things like that, um, and trying to find a way to either put that on your resume or to talk about it in terms of the skills and experience that you have had during this um, caregiving time. Um, and then last, I wanted to say, know uh, that you're not alone and don't give up. Um, seek out resources to help you um, and start searching for support that you may need early on. Um, so for example, if uh, you know that you will need childcare, start getting on wait lists and, and thinking about that, um, you know, so that it will hopefully be ready um, for you when you are ready to begin um, that employment again. Well, thank you for that. So I'll say, I'll open it up, Heather, Teresa, or Eve, any suggestions for applicants? Um, and so, you know, I'll start with Heather, but uh, anything you wanna add? Uh, I think Elizabeth has it, has it spot on. I think you need to be honest about your gap. And I, I'm so sad to hear, Elizabeth, that you still have folks who are telling you that they're being asked to explain what they've been doing the last two years, because I had hoped with this mass amount of unemployment due to this sort of, you know, once in a lifetime situation that employers would sort of lose that old prejudice. But I think being honest about the gap and having a really good narrative to frame it in a positive light, to talk about the skills you developed while you were, um, you know, in this, in this break and during this gap uh, and, you know, what you can now bring to back to the workforce as a result of the skills you gained or the experience you gained in that gap. I think that's really, um, for me, and when we talk about this um, to uh, 50 plus workers, we have uh, resources on our, on our website, like how to answer awkward interview questions. One of them is how do you handle that gap in employment and if you're asked about it. And I think being honest is, is key, honest and positive. I would add to that um, for people who are living with arrest or conviction records, workshop how you're gonna answer that question. You don't wanna be caught off guard that question is gonna come up at some point. And the best thing that you're gonna be able to do is to really have this figured out. Workshop it if you can with someone who has a conviction history and has navigated it so that they can provide you with the right advice to kind of help you go through that process. You know, it's frustrating, it's hard, but don't give up. Um, do your homework, talk to some re-entry service providers in your area, find out from them who do they know who's hiring and you know just, 
keep beating the path. We've heard from a lot of people sometimes, you know, it has taken a hundred interviews before they've gotten a job. But again, don't give up. Find a way to summarize your experience, even the work that you were doing in prison from an asset base. And, you know, I am just really hopeful that in this moment when there is just so many employers looking for talent, that you will find the right job. Thank you. Eve? I would have to echo everything that, that has been said. The only other thing I would add is because the ADA does prohibit employers from, from doing pre-employment inquiries into disability, I would, if, if anybody with or without a disability gets a question about whether you have a disability, I would say, as I advise everyone, you say, oh, that I just heard this webinar by Eve Hill. And she said, if anybody asked that, she would totally sue them. Here's her email. Um, and you can also carry around the EEOC documents that say you can't ask these questions. And everybody should, because it doesn't just protect people with disabilities, it also protects people without disabilities. So then you say, so I'm trying to save you from liability by not answering this question. <laughs> Off you go. Um, but that, I think the idea of workshopping how to answer the question about the gap in your resume is really, really important. And you can talk in that, about that gap, how it, part of it is what makes you special. And part of it is what made you a better uh, employee going forward. So I think that all of that is really good. Well, thank you. And I'll turn it back to Director Yang. Well, thank you all for a really a tremendous discussion. As we wrap up and consider the work ahead, I'd like to give you each a chance to share a top priority that you have to advance equity and meaningful change in recruitment and hiring practices. So um, why don't we start with um, Teresa? Yeah, so for me, it's uh, my top priority is letting employers know that the traditional old way of running a background check is not enough, um, that that one piece of data is not enough to know who is before you today. And we have to make sure that we are getting the context and just making sure that this person is ready for the opportunity. Matching people to the opportunity is the key. And yes, we do have to take into consideration the fact that people do have arrest or conviction records, but we should deny opportunity only and if it makes sense. Thank you, Teresa, for that uh, important priority. Um, Heather, what would you like to highlight? I would like to highlight that uh, based on this really rapidly changing skill landscape and the speed with which skills are changing, we really need to make sure that all workers are included in the great reskilling. You know, we're talking about the great resignation, the great reshuffle. The great reskilling is upon us. And, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum estimates that half of employees today in five years will need to be upskilled. Uh, and so we just, I just want to, um, we're working on this issue at AERP to make sure that employers remember older uh, mid and late career workers in their reskilling efforts. Um, it's a great two for one because you, you retain these folks with all their institutional knowledge and soft skills while reskilling them and retooling them for the directions that your organization is going. So reskilling re is my sort of one thing that I'm, I'm focused on this year. Thanks so much, Heather. That's a very important priority for the Department of Labor as well. So I really appreciate your highlighting that. Eve, if uh, we could turn to you, what is your top priority you wanna highlight? My top priority sort of across the board is to have every employer understand that what they know about disability is wrong. All they know about disability that is correct is that they don't know anything. So <laughs> put it all out of your mind, it's all incorrect. And so start over afresh. Okay, thanks, Eve. Um, and Elizabeth, what would you like so to work leave us with? Yes, so working for an advocacy organization, um, we really need better laws and policies um, and enforcement of our current laws and policies so that caregivers don't face punishment at work, including the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which um, is awaiting a Senate vote. So that I would just say, thinking about it systematically, um, it really benefits employers for everyone to be on a level playing field when we have those clear federal laws that um, ensure that people don't face punishment for their caregiving. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you all really for a fascinating discussion today and really such important and actionable advice. I will turn it back over to Chair Burroughs to share her concluding remarks. Well, thank you. And I'd just like to say my sincere thanks to everyone who joined us today and special thanks, of course, to uh, co-chair of this effort for hire, Director Yang and all of our colleagues at the EEOC and the OFCCP who helped prepare for today's events. And most of all, I'd really like to thank our distinguished guests for their time and really valuable insights. Discussions like the one we had today are critical to help identify barriers for workers who have gaps in their employment, uh, including caregivers, older workers, the formerly incarcerated and persons with disabilities. I appreciated hearing all of our guests discuss the myriad skills that these workers bring to the table and how employers can utilize the promising practices identified today in their recruiting and hiring efforts. And giving equal consideration to all candidates, regardless of resume gaps, is one way that employers can promote our nation's values and sustain a diverse, equitable, inclusive, and accessible workplace. By promoting dis, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the workplace, we can help ensure that as our nation recovers from the pandemic, we build an inclusive economy that works for everyone. So I look forward to the work ahead and to what we can accomplish together. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Well, thanks so much, Chair Burroughs. I really enjoyed this opportunity to collaborate with you and everyone at the EOC. I'd like to thank our team at OFCCP as well, and especially thanks to our speakers for a truly dynamic and informative discussion. We are so appreciative of the work that you are doing and your commitment to advancing equal opportunity and hiring and for sharing the tremendous knowledge you bring to these issues with us and everyone joining us today. We had over 3,000 people register for this program, which shows the broad interest in these issues. And I want to especially thank all of you who joined us today for your virtual attendance and participation. And we invite you to continue this journey with us. We want to hear from you. We want to hear about the work that you're doing to develop innovative recruiting and hiring initiatives. Please feel free to share those resources, uh, research, and ideas with us at hire-initiative at eeoc.gov and hire-initiative at dol.gov. You can also sign up for messages and updates from our agencies through the Gov delivery system that we each use. We also have a landing page at each of our agency websites for hire, and we are continuing to update that with new events and materials. As Chair Burroughs mentioned, this is our second roundtable session. In case you missed it, you can access a recording of our first roundtable online at the EOC channel on YouTube, which is uh, www.youtube.com slash user slash the EEOC. And we will be hosting um, this recording on uh, that uh, YouTube channel as well. And finally, we will be hosting more of these roundtable discussions to engage a broad array of stakeholders in the pursuit of our common goal to expand access to good jobs for workers from underrepresented communities and to help address key hiring and recruiting challenges. So please join us in the work ahead. All are welcome. And we thank you again for joining us today. Take care all.